Welcome to the New Thinking for a New World podcast, where we explore the most pressing issues that are challenging and changing our societies. We are looking for new thinking and new solutions wherever we can find them. Listen as host Alan Stoga, the Talberg Foundation's chairman, challenges his guests for analysis, ideas and actions. Together, we can help make our world at least a bit better. COP26 is perhaps the ultimate exercise in global power politics. Countries negotiating their futures as well as the future lives of their citizens. Massive commitments of money, potentially huge changes in how nations interact with each other, a global inflection point. Isn't it odd then that the leader of one of the most powerful countries in the world, the People's Republic of China, is not in Glasgow? What's more important than climate And why would someone of President Xi's stature and ambition forego the chance to star on the global stage? Does Xi's absence say something about how he views existing global institutions or something about the relevance of those institutions to China's future? Or maybe something else. Australian Kevin Rudd has spent a considerable part of his life thinking about, working on, and negotiating with China as the Labour Party's shadow foreign minister, as a diplomat, twice as his country's prime minister, and currently as president of the Asia Society. Arguably, no other Western leader knows China better. Welcome, Kevin. Good to be with you. Good to be with our friends from Talberg. I'd like to start with Glasgow, or at least with the geopolitics of COP26. Why do you think President Xi skipped the G20 and COP? I have a pretty um, uh, simple view of that. It's a Marxist-Leninist state. They are highly protective of the physical health of their leaders. And I don't think uh, Xi Jinping or those who are responsible for his uh, physical security would have been prepared to unleash him uh, into um, the world uh, at a time when uh, COVID-19 is still raging, even though COVID-19 erupted from China in the first place. Um, I know the system reasonably well. If you look at Xi Jinping's pattern of meetings with foreign leaders at present, they're very limited in Beijing. So this is all to do about, uh, frankly, uh, leadership paranoia about the physical well-being of the leadership. So I don't place a huge amount of store by this. What I am more concerned about is the limited scope of China's declaration Uh, at uh, COP26, the so-called NDC, Nationally Determined Contribution, by China through to 2030, and the relatively lacklustre nature of uh, Xi Jinping's written remarks uh, for the conference. Uh, That, I think, is disappointing, given how much uh, ground we need to cover to uh, increase effective levels of global ambition to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through this decade, the 2020s which will determine whether or not we reach carbon neutrality by 2050, which in turn will determine whether we keep global temperatures within 1.5 degrees centigrade by century's end. Well, even to that point, uh, the Chinese delegation at Glasgow has suggested that perhaps 1.5 is not possible and we should be thinking about two or perhaps even something else. So the It's not pushback, but it certainly isn't the kind of full-throated commitment to aggressive climate adjustment that we're hearing from certainly the bureaucrats, but even even, even the leaders uh, who have been gathered in Glasgow. Now, is that China being realistic? We're not going to get it anyhow. Is it China not interested in this set of this approach to these problems. It, it does seem, as, as you said, they, they certainly aren't jumping in with two feet enthusiastically on board. Why is that? Well, against the benchmark of where they were, and I've been up against the Chinese on climate questions now since 2007, um, and in Copenhagen in 2009, where they sought with India to torpedo that conference of the parties altogether. In 2015, we're on the back of a new collaborative relationship with Obama. And they actually were constructive parties in the Paris Agreement of that year. Uh, Through to the present, 
um, and the most recent statements of the last uh, year or so, which is carbon neutrality for China by 2060, and now a ban on official finance to support coal-fired power constructions uh, from uh, Chinese sources uh, around the world through the so-called BRI or Belt and Road Initiative countries. Uh, this is a reasonable trajectory of, um, of uh, turning the ship of state around on climate change. But the reason they're doing it, it's not because they love you or love me or love President Obama or um, whatever their attitude to President Biden might be. It's because their own national scientific establishment has reached a hard-nosed conclusion that unless China decisively acts on climate change itself, um, then it will undermine its own economic and environmental future by mid-century to a radical extent, which would then undermine China's aspirations for global great power status. Um, so therefore, what's driving this is not so much, frankly, the Court of International Public Opinion, that's an element, uh, it's their own domestic scientific consensus. And militating against that are their continued concerns about energy security uh, in China, um, given that they are still, as it were, on the development curve. So I think if we had this conversation in Beijing, what they'd say to us around the table is, haven't you guys seen what we've done in the last several years? We're still, as it were, uh, average per capita income of um, six or $7,000 US. We haven't broken through the middle income trap yet. There's 1.4 billion of us. Uh, give us a break. My view is they still need to do more. Um, but um, we need to be equally mindful of the journey that they've already travelled. Fair point. If we were in a, a conversation in Beijing right now, they'd also be telling us that they have an energy crisis, that mm -hmm. they have a significant shortfall of electric capacity, not of capacity, but electric production. They are scrambling around the markets, sucking up coal, sucking up gas. Uh, Economic indicators have flatlined, much to everybody's surprise. Uh, there was recently a statement out of the government asking people to stockpile, consumers to stockpile staples, which is a sort of thing that usually gets people to run out and buy way too much and cause a crisis. Mm -hmm. um, is, is there a chance that something's going on in the economy that the leadership did not anticipate that a country which has, after the 2008 and, and again in 2020, taught Keynes a lesson in terms of how you really spend money and, and, and unleash the money supply to avoid any downside risk. Suddenly, they, th there's a sense, a curious sense, that maybe there's a little loss of control. Is, am I exaggerating, do you think? The, the debate about energy security in China is a perennial one when average growth rates for the last 30 or 40 years have been north of 10% uh, for the economy, which means your uh, additions to total installed capacity in the energy system uh, has obviously had to proceed at that pace. Secondly, as they've um, then uh, reined in the construction of coal-fired power stations at home, Obviously, renewables have increased considerably, but like many other economies, they still run into the problem of, let's call it, energy storage from renewables. Um, so this is still an ongoing debate within China. Um, uh, one of the formulas, for example, that the Chinese uh, privately will talk to you about is, while coal-fired power stations may be being retained and some new stations built within the country, um, there is a strong push within China to have this, as it were, a reserve fleet of power stations uh, to only be deployed if renewables, as it were, fail to deliver the goods. So there's a really active debate about all this within the country. I do not have a definitive answer to your question, what brought about the current energy shortage? Because it's quite hard to disentangle the various elements of the debate, but this is part of it. Uh, the second um, uh, element to your question is, uh, what about uh, other political uh, frailties within the Chinese system at present, uh, coming off slower economic growth? My overall thesis about the growth slowdown is that part of it's structural, 
transformation from a high growth to a medium growth country, which we've seen in developing countries' trajectory around the world since the beginning of economic history. But there's a new factor uh, since 2017, which I think is adding to the degree of difficulty. And that's Xi Jinping's uh, decision to change the growth model. And in changing the growth model, uh, at one level, it seems okay. We're not going to rely upon an old model of, um, of a low-wage labour-intensive manufacturing for export, uh, high levels of state investment and infrastructure as the underpinnings of long-term growth. Instead, we're moving to higher quality growth driven out of higher levels of domestic consumption, a more uh, robust Chinese private sector uh, delivering uh, greater growth into the Chinese services sector. Uh, but underneath all that, the big shift has been, frankly, uh, in Xi Jinping's attitude to the private economy, private firms and the private entrepreneurial class. And you've seen an overall pivot to the left within China's overall political economy structure. And as a result, private fixed capital investment is, frankly, not robust. Private business sentiment is not robust. And uh, the private sector is not growing as rapidly as we used to it growing in the past. So this grand ideological experiment of Xi Jinping occurring on the back of other deeper structural changes in the economy, in my judgment, will lead to a lower growth number. I've been saying that for the last several years before it became fashionable to say it, um, because the entrails have been there for us to observe since the 19th Party Congress back in 2017. And the data are in fact showing what you are describing. It's looking, literally, it's flat. The numbers are, as you know, are flatlining right now. Now, that may just be seasonal. Who knows? Um, but it may well be a test to Xi's ability to continue, and this is a question, to consolidate his power and get himself reelected. I use air quotes on that word uh, next year, which is obviously, you have written somewhere that he wants to have a, uh, a life in power at least as long as Mao's, um, which, which would keep him going for, I think, I think it's 2035. My yeah. operating assumption is 2035 is a reasonable number he'd have in mind. His mother's still alive, by the way. She's 92, and uh, his father lived until he was 89. So the family genes aren't too bad. The family genes aren't too bad, but um, these systems, and you've pointed this out elsewhere, these systems have tough time that they, they get they get rigid over time with single leadership okay what would it take what would he have to produce to sustain himself in power that long what are the consequences for the rest of us of, of this person's desire and ambition to hold on to power for a long time well how would he do it and then secondly what would its implications be on the first question, on balance, if I'm looking at the 20th Party Congress next November, if I was going down to the local betting shop uh, here in Australia, and in my country we tend to bet on flies crawling up a wall, so uh, and who will get there first, I think the money would certainly still be on Xi's uh, re-elect. Uh, there's a reason for that. His purges of his political opponents within the party over the last nine years have been forensic and taking out anyone who would actually uh, raise their voice against him effectively. And secondly, um, never underestimate uh, what the um, uh, digital revolution and the artificial intelligence revolution has done for the powers of the Chinese security establishment uh, focused internally, and that is to monitor people in terms of any possible dissent against his leadership. Uh, it's still at the same time he's going to continue to have to produce positive economic outcomes. So if you were to ask uh, what I think his principal vulnerability would be is if growth really slows uh, on a sustainable basis, then this would pose questions as to why did you depart from the Deng Xiaoping model which served China so well, effectively from uh, 1978 through until 2017. Why did you embark upon this new period of what's called Xi Jinping thought um, on uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics, which is the snappy phrase now to discover the, uh, the new ideological orthodoxy. Um, 
the third one, which uh, would need to go right for him, is continuing to uh, fan the flames of Chinese nationalism, but without actually crossing uh, over the line into crisis conflict, let alone even war, with the United States or Japan, because that could be, uh, frankly, a bridge too far for the Chinese Communist Party at this stage. Having said all that, I still think he'll get across the line. And I think uh, for the United States and for its allies in Asia and in uh, Europe, uh, Xi Jinping represents the single most formidable challenge to the continuation of American global and regional power uh, that we have seen. Uh, and I include in that uh, it, uh, the comparison with the old Soviet Union. What do climate change and jazz greats John Patitucci, Terry Lynn Carrington, and Joe Lovano have in common? Telberg's Jazz for the Planet. Listen and watch them perform new music about the climate and about climate action at jazzfortheplanet.org. Uh, you have argued elsewhere that um, it would have been reasonable to expect a warming of relations between China and the United States when President Biden took office. Um, after all, Biden was committed to throwing off whatever Trump had done. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the people who populate his, his security establishment, his foreign policy establishment, were all known. Um, I, I, I we're use the word moderates in quotes, but moderates. Uh, Secretary Kerry was clearly trying to push climate to the top of the list and climate demands cooperation as opposed to confrontation. One, there's a long list of things that would have argued for uh, a, a shift back towards a more collaborative environment uh, in terms of the US-Chinese relationship. And then Anchorage occurs. Um, and we have the first important meeting between the two sides and it's, it, it's a mess to, to be polite. And it's gone downhill since then. So we have uh, President Biden in, in uh, Glasgow continually talking about the Chinese mistake of not coming, that they're not doing their, they're, they're not pulling their weight, really quite aggressive. Um, we have Biden talking about uh, rethinking or restating the nature of the American commitment to Taiwan um, in ways that uh, those of us who read entrails say, oh my God, he didn't really say that. Uh, whereas most of mankind probably didn't notice that he said that. Uh, but there is clearly this, and, and the Chinese rhetoric has, has moved also apace to become harsher and harsher. Uh, I guess the question, is it real or is it Memorex? Is, it, uh, is there a real worsening of the relationship, do you think? No, objectively, there is a real worsening of the relationship. And there are three structural reasons why this is occurring, which beyond the uh, sound and fury of the daily media show, either in Beijing or in Washington, uh, are important to reflect upon. Number one, China is more powerful than it was 10 years ago against any um, matrix of national economic power, uh, whether it's the size of its economy, the size of its equity markets, the size of its debt markets, its technological evolution, um, the size of its military, the sophistication of its military, um, as well as um, a range of other, let's call it, measures of power. The Chinese use an old Soviet term, by the way. They use the term comprehensive national power, zonghe guoli, uh, which is their attempt to put all the variables of national power into this giant baking tin, and kind of mix it up, uh, and then out the end side of the UNIVAC computer goes, blip, uh, you are now um, the second most powerful in the world. Um, now, objectively, therefore, against those levers of power, um, um, China is infinitely more powerful than it was at the beginning of the Xi Jinping period, um, and uh, certainly more powerful than it was when it um, signed on to the WTO back in uh, 2002. Second uh, structural factor at work is Xi Jinping. Um, leaders matter. Uh, I don't have a... Um, a determinist view of history, uh, leaders actually matter. They make decisions which change the course of history, though they work within the ebbs and flows of structural movements as well. 
And this guy is um, loud and proud uh, about Chinese national power as opposed to his predecessor, which was hide and buy um, under Deng Xiaoping. And loud and proud means being out there and assertive of China's foreign and security policy interests in the region and the world and about its ideological commitment to an authoritarian capitalist model, not their words, my words, uh, as opposed to what they would define as the failures of liberal capitalism in the West. A second structural factor. The third is from about 2017, when H.R. McMaster was National Security Advisor, uh, these um, changes in Chinese power and let's call it posture under its leadership then began to, uh, to generate an equal and opposite reaction, both in the United States and many of its allies. Um, and as a result, the, the other factor that's now at play structurally is America finding, um, as it were, the new um, ground station, the ground point uh, for its, all, its own now changed national China strategy, away from four decades of strategic engagement to this new ill-defined era of strategic competition. So those are the structural factors at work. Um, and that's why we have such Sturm und Drang uh, in the um, uh, US-China relationship. It's not just because we've got a bunch of wolf warriors running around the place mouthing off or the odd indiscipline speech out of the administration. These are the structural forces that are at work. But at the same time, certainly in recent months, we've had an endless ratcheting up of Chinese pressure on Taiwan, more overflights, more noise. Um, on the other hand, and we'll get to the quad in a minute and, and, and the submarines, et cetera, we've had some stiffening of the spine on the other side. Um, if you were to take a snapshot of where the noise is, you, it, this is a video, not a snapshot, it's a video, so we've got noise, we've got pictures. It feels like the tensions around Taiwan are higher than they've been for a while. It's, it's real, but it's not historically unprecedented. Uh, we had uh, two Taiwan Straits crises uh, in the 1990s with U.S. carrier deployments uh, to um, that area, which uh, infuriated the Chinese. In fact, um, created the national political spur to a uh, new era of Chinese investment in the People's Liberation Army Navy. Uh, so that, quote, we would never be so humiliated again um, as having these uh, enormous US carrier battle groups uh, sailing around just offshore. Um, I think also we need to bear in mind, uh, historically, 50s and 60s, there were three major crises across the Taiwan Straits. And these guys used to be shelling each other in terms of their offshore islands. So, um, so we've been around this dance floor once or twice before, just frankly, not within the living memory of most current political operatives um, uh, in, uh, in Washington. But um, I have a view that what's changed here is a reflection of the power dynamics I mentioned before. China is more powerful with more capability, both economic, technological, and military. Second, Xi Jinping, through until 2035, at the tender age of 82, um, um, in my judgment, in my analysis, is determined to bring Taiwan back to Chinese sovereignty on his watch. I do not think uh, this will be an initiated piece of Chinese policy in the 2020s, but I'm much more worried about the 2030s. And the reason I say that is because the balance of power between them militarily across the Taiwan Straits will be much more decisively in China's favour by then, unless the United States manages to close the capabilities gap, which has emerged over the last decade. So you've answered my next question already. I was about to ask you whether the Chinese are losing their strategic patience, and you've answered no. 2030s is still a long way away. Uh, losing their strategic patience in terms of um, simply pushing this off into what we in Australia would call the never-never, uh, which is just, you know, some point in the, in the uh, you know, about uh, when we expect um, Jesus' return. Uh, that is, you know, <laughs> so far into the future that it's, it's not calculable. Uh, now, Xi Jinping, I think, is moving the Chinese system towards timetabling. 
But my sense of timetabling is we need to start getting worried uh, late 20s, early 30s, uh, rather than getting worried in 2021, 2022. doesn't mean you can't have co crisis, conflict or, or war through accident, that is misadventure, collisions, etc. And we know enough from Sarajevo to know how those sort of things get out of control. Um, um, but that's different from war by design and intention. I'm more worried about that uh, by the time we get to about a decade from now. So meanwhile, and one of the other significant developments or, or redevelopments is the Quad, is mm -hmm. that there is this strategic conversation. You've been part of it uh, for years, uh, but it's rejuvenated. The strategic conversation among the United States, Australia, Japan, India, uh, which has a different tonality to it, it seems to me now, a different urgency to it, has the very specific submarine deal as, as sort of part of it, although the UK nuzzles its nose in there to make it more than a quad, I guess. Um, you have talked about the, the potential significance of the quad, uh, potentially mm. key word there, I think, as more than just um, uh, an Asian NATO, that is something that could be potentially really quite broad. How do, you, how do you think about the Quad's potential at least? And are we smart enough to realize it? Yeah, the Quad has evolved in two phases. The first phase was back in 2007. There's a bit of a thought bubble from uh, Shinzo Abe, the Prime Minister of Japan, when he was in office for 12 months that year. Uh, but ultimately was not supported by the United States or by India or by Abe's successor, uh, uh, Prime Minister Fukuda, uh, or our own government in Australia. Um, so Quad Mark I didn't go anywhere. Um, Quad Mark II uh, was effectively rebirthed a couple of years ago. Um, and, of course, it reached its um, uh, zenith uh, under within months of uh, President Biden taking over when you had the first ever Quad Summit um, and we had uh, the first physical summit in Washington not long after the General Assembly uh, meeting in, um, uh, in uh, September uh, in uh, New York. I think if you look at the scope of Quad Mark II, uh, what has been the big change? The big change has been India and the Sino-Indian border war, a border, not war, but clash uh, of uh, June of 2020 fundamentally shook the Indonesian, Indian foreign policy and national security policy establishment to its foundations, caused them to conclude that they could no longer just sustain a posture of, uh, let's say, uh, fence-sitting on the future of the Quad, uh, but that China represented such a deep threat to themselves that they had to actually uh, participate in a form of collective security policy response. And that's what's decisively changed, both in terms of the Quad's military dimensions, its naval exercise dimensions, its high-level political collaboration, regular summits, regular meetings of foreign defence ministers, uh, even now becoming a platform for, shall we say, broader vaccine diplomacy uh, in Asia. So China, I think, on this question miscalculated. Um, they thought that the internal divisions... Uh, with the four quad members would be too large uh, to uh, uh, enable the quad to become a viable, substantive uh, military counterbalancing force uh, against China in the Indo-Pacific region. And so China is now in the process of, frankly, recalibrating its own strategy, seeking to demonise the quad in the international political debate while substantively, I think, revisiting uh, its current allocation of budgetary resources to its military to offset what it now sees to be a much more robust posture in the United States, in Japan, in India, and also uh, in Australia. Certainly their prior strategy had been, as you described it, kill one to warn a hundred. And, mm. and Australia was the designated kill E. Um, let's put the maximum amount of pressure on Australia, and this would send all the signals we needed to send to others, and this thing would go away. We were the designated geopolitical red kill. Yeah, that, they, that was quite clear. And um, do you think they've recalculated? Is that part of their recalculation? Is, is that where the submarine deal comes in? 
leave the specifics aside. Yeah, so, I think um, always bear in mind if you're a student of the Soviet Union um, and a student of Marxism and Leninism that the Chinese ultimately are dialecticians, uh, which means that they study action and reaction in a Hegelian sense, but also a Marxist sense. So in some respects, they regard this as partly inevitable. China's more powerful. China's become more assertive. Therefore, other countries are either going to bandwagon with that or seek to balance against it to use the international relations theory literature. And they're not surprised, therefore, um, that the um, uh, balancing against China phenomenon is unfolding. I think what they're really surprised by is how um, robust it's been so early um, and that it's overcome historical divisions uh, within, for example, quad countries or, for that matter, AUKUS countries. I'll leave aside the inelegant execution of, uh, of AUKUS and uh, La Belle France and, uh, and the rest of uh, that equation. Um, but I think from a grand strategy perspective, China will now look at the map of the Indo-Pacific region and see three things unfolding. This kind of uh, outer ring of, let's call it the quad, uh, if you look at the geography of um, where Australia is in extended Southeast Asia, where Japan is in extended Northeast Asia, where India by definition is in South Asia, the Indian Ocean, together with this hovering global presence of a um, Pacific present United States. Then um, an even harder edge within that, which is now the uh, purported, not yet substantial, but purported uh, set of AUKUS arrangements, um, and then at a third level, you have what I would describe as the battle for hearts and minds across the rest of Southeast and South Asia and the outstanding question of the Republic of Korea and Northeast Asia. Um, Southeast Asia, in my judgment, looms as the geostrategic swing state, to use American domestic political parlance, between China and let's call it the United States and the Quad. And that, I think, is where a lot of the political and economic and foreign policy action is underway as we speak. And this, I suspect, is where the Chinese need for Taiwan works against them. It actually hurts them in many of those places because they can't separate that from their history. Um, but let me just end by asking you the, the question that interviewers have to ask. Um, what would most surprise you that you, if you woke up tomorrow and the headline said, what? What do you worry about, in other words? I worry about two things. Um, on the Chinese side of the ledger, what I worry about um, is conflict by misadventure. That is, in a given nationalist political environment leading up to the 20th Party Congress, particularly if the Chinese economy domestically starts to um, uh, weaken, then PLA commanders um, in either of the three or four contending theatres, let's just say the South China Sea, Taiwan and the East China Sea, undertaking manoeuvres or operations together with PLAF, the People's Liberation Army Air Force, which results in a physical collision with a US or Japanese vessel or aircraft. Uh, that becomes a bit like phosphorus on water. Um, and uh, that worries me because the history of international relations demonstrates that humans are very bad at managing crises when they arise. Um, they are more predisposed towards escalation than containment. The second thing that keeps me awake at night, it's more of a long-term, shall I say, nightmare rather than a short-term dream, um, is um, America still being out to lunch on the question of global free trade. Um, my message to an American audience is pretty simple. If you guys in the United States think that you can uh, develop a grand strategy for dealing with China's rise and excise trade, uh, from that equation, um, or your global economic leadership from that equation, then you've got rocks in your head. Um, and uh, America's power in the world is not just 
derivative of the fact that to militarily you were the decisive force in securing the outcomes in the Second World War, not just that you set about building a bunch of global institutions, but you also led the global economic order. But when you've got this protectionist um, takeover of the Congress, both uh, with Republicans traditionally the party of free trade and the Democrats even harder line on this question now and think that somehow we can run a coherent global and regional uh, China strategy while conceding greater Asia to the Chinese economy. Well, uh, as the Congress uh, seeks to out-protectionist uh, each other um, and, the, and the Trans-Pacific Partnership dies and other free trading arrangements in the region the world die because it's all too politically difficult uh, as you seek to get yourself uh, reselected uh, to run for the Democrat or the Republican Party in a congressional primary somewhere or other, uh, whether it's in Boise, Idaho, or in the Bronx or in Brooklyn, um, then guess what? You actually hand the strategic game to China on a platter. Um, so that's the longer term, I think, uh, nightmare which your friends, partners and allies have around the world that you guys clock out for crude domestic politics on global trade and economic leadership, rather than being the global leaders of free trade, which you were for such a long period of time. It is a fear. I fear it's a prediction. Um, and I think the next time we talk, I, we'll start with rocks in our heads, because I suspect <laughs> that, that, is, that, that is, that that is that's a mind that has a lot in it to be, to be discussed. So thank you very much for this conversation. Um, and and let's, let's 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 hope that your your prediction that in absent a mistake we've got a while to work this one out is a good one. Thank you very much, Ken. Good to be with you. Thank you for joining us. Please rate our show on Apple Podcast and subscribe. Meanwhile, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or you can subscribe to our newsletter at talbergfoundation.org to learn more about our work. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org. Thank you, and we'll be back again next week for another episode of Talberg's New Thinking for a New World. This podcast was brought to you through the generous support of SNF, the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation. <laughs>